Brian, thank you so much for making some time to hang yes. out with me today. So um, the, the thought here is so many people will joke and say when they see me with somebody, I wish I could be a fly on the wall and find out what it is you guys talk about. And we, you and I have some really uh, interesting conversations over the phone or, or just somewhat in private. And so, so many of my takeaways, I figured, why don't we actually just record one of our conversations and share it with everybody so they can hear the stuff we talk about. So I know you, uh, I grew up in the same market as you. Your family's last name was kind of ubiquitous with the industry that I grew up in, in real estate. Um, and I've, I've known you probably 20 years, either by name or by association through some mutual friends. Most of the agents that work with us know you as an author of Building an Empire and Untrapped, which are wildly successful in our industry. But I wanted to just have you tell a little bit of your backstory and then we can just jump into some thoughts I have in my head. Yeah, yeah. So um, for anybody that doesn't know my real estate background, I, I got home from Villanova University in 92 with an accounting degree, which I never used. Looks good on my wall whenever I'm doing my own taxes. I uh, jumped right into real estate. So at age 21, I was rookie of the year for Montgomery County, Maryland, and didn't take much to do that back then. And uh, all through my 20s, I was a, uh, a hustling real estate agent, you know, doing the seven day a week, you know, just out there making my name. And, and uh, I was making six figures in real estate by the time I was almost 25. So I was doing pretty, pretty decent. And so, uh, you know, the family real estate company grew. Uh, my dad built one of the largest real estate companies on the East Coast back in the 70s, uh, 35 offices. Uh, it was bigger than Long and Foster and Weicker back then. And he sold it to uh, Merrill Lynch in 81. And after his five year non-compete, uh, he got back into the game again in 86, thinking that maybe in the early 90s when my brother and I got out of school, we might want to join him and build with him, which we did. And um, and so anyway, uh, when I uh, left real estate, which is now 25 years ago, uh, we had 24 offices. It kept in t they continued to grow it, and uh, they, the family sold it to Pentagon Federal Credit Union. So it became went from Prudential Carruthers to Prudential PenFed, and my brother stayed on with PenFed to help them buy real estate companies around the country, and now it's Berkshire Hathaway PenFed. So that's kind of the the, the real estate uh, path that I that I come from. Excellent. And so, when did you pivot out of real estate? Yeah, that was uh, in uh, September of 1998. Uh, I was involved in the, with a side business, and I wound up uh, getting very very attracted uh, to the network marketing industry. And matter of fact, this is an interesting story I actually shared with with Glenn in Dallas about a month ago. Um, I, I saw the network marketing industry. Matter of fact, I cut my teeth in it for about three and a half years, made no money, but I, I loved the uh, promise of uh, passive income, uh, building a team and getting overrides and residual income. And so I went to my brother and dad in 97 and I said, I want to incorporate that into our real estate company. And they said, nope, we're not doing it. And I said, well, you guys are crazy. And I said, uh, well, you know what? You just opened up that new virtual office in, in Rockville. Why don't you go ahead and test it out over there? And they kind of shoved, they just kind of ushered me away. So I did it. I called it the network bonus program. It paid four levels down and agents can recruit agents. And uh, and it was just getting started to work uh, when I was recruiting another agent who told me about the side project with now company Legal, Legal Shield. And um, so anyway, um, prior to EXP, uh, I already knew that this rev share model so was you, a brilliant you, you, model. You yeah. invented the virtual real estate company with a direct sale component. Yeah. Uh, should I be trading places with Glenn <laughs> right now? I mean, <laughs> I, I, uh, my, my buddy has a quote on his wall that says, innovation is rewarded, but execution is worshipped. So I, I always yeah. like to tell people, you know, it doesn't matter if it's your idea, if you didn't pull the trigger and saw it all the way through. And stick with it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you started that and then your, your friend presented the opportunity? Yeah, so I was uh, recruiting another real estate agent and he told me about Legal Shield in that interview and I saw the residuals and I saw the value of the service and I was doing it part time and it just exploded. And uh, uh, I just, I, you know, the mission of it really caught me. So um, it was hard uh, to leave the family business, uh, but it was also something for me to go out and cut my own path and uh, make my own name. I was under the Carruthers name and it was never going to be my company that I built. So that was kind of a uh, one of the uh, driving factors for me to, to take it seriously. But uh, the story on that in a nutshell, uh, you know, I, I got started like everybody else did and started sharing the service and building a team. And that team has now grown to over 400,000 um, associates or distributors, whatever you want to call it, and uh, signed up about two and a half million customers. And 
you know, the promise of, of RevShare, the promise of network marketing. I'm a living, breathing example of if you build it uh, and, and you stick to it and you see it through, you know, I, I make more in a month than I used to make in a year, and that's predictable. Like, I could stop working tomorrow, not work another day of my life, and that residual cash flow will keep coming in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And part of the reasons I can, uh, I can say that is because the company is 51 years old. 51 years 51 old. 51 years old. So um, if, I, if it was a startup, I, I, I could say I'm making a lot of money right now, and I hope and pray it's still going to be here 20 years from now. Uh, but because it's already been paying me for 25 years residuals, and it's, the company's been in business for double that, I can predictably and comfortably and confidently say that um, you know my kids or grandkids will be receiving residual income from the company. So I put a lot of stock and value in uh, in company strength and longevity because that's that's what I'm building it for. Well, that, that that's a really interesting comment because um, you know Glenn had about a 10 year run with no competition, and it, I, and I've said it publicly and I continue to say it. He invented a category in the real estate industry that is no longer a theory. It's it's we're now the largest by agent count and largest by transaction count. So yeah. the model worked and it's here to stay. And now we have, you know, 20 some plus uh, knockoffs that are all attempting to to be us. And I'm, I'm always curious because I hear the the sentence, you know, ground floor opportunity or the next best thing. What, what, I'm sure you've encountered that in your industry. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the network marketing industry that Legal Shield is in and the AXP is in is a network marketing model. So it's all kind of in the same category. Um, there's another one forming every day. I mean, there's thousands of network marketing companies, and there's a lot of them in different categories. You got health and wellness. You got skin cream to make your face look less wrinkly. You got you know, the vitamins, you got the long distance, you got, you know, power, you got with us legal services. They, they, if there's a product or service that needs to be taken to marketplace, the best way to do it, um, where you get a free sales force, where you don't have to go out and hire and pay people salaries, is use the network marketing independent contractor, independent business owner model. So it just makes sense. Um, I get pitched. Some people will still bring me opportunities to say, hey, Brian, I want to recruit you and then I'll, be, I'll get rich. Uh, but I, I, I invite the, 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 the pitches just because of where I'm at in the space. And a lot of these companies, hundreds of company, you, you, companies use my books and my trainings uh, to teach in recruiting and team building and leadership and all that. So I like to know the landscape of what's going on out there. Um, and what's interesting is the typical pitch is, hey, Brian, look at this. Imagine what you could do with this being ground floor. If you did what you did in that company that was already 27 years old when you got started, imagine what you could do in this startup. You could be one of the first ones there. I'm like, and I have to remind them, and this is just a lesson I get a, I get a chance to convey to those folks. I, I never rain on the parade. I don't wanna make them feel bad, whether I like or don't like their opportunity, that um, when I first got into Legal Shield, the company was 27 years old. And people that were had any network marketing experience, everyone to a person said to me, Brian, you don't make money in network marketing unless you're at the beginning. Because every, you know, you've already missed the boat. It's, it's, it's old hat, you know, it's gotta be ground floor. And I told him, I said, I don't want a ground floor company because most ground floor companies never get off the ground. And a lot of them that do get off the ground, they come crashing back within a, after about a three year run and it's not exciting anymore. And everybody's looking for the next ground floor to go jump into. I said, I want a rock solid company tapping into a ground floor industry. Hmm. And that's what I found. I want to put my head on my pillow at night knowing when I wake up tomorrow, my company, my check will still be there. And I couldn't say that uh, confidently with a, with a ground floor. And, and are, there, are there a bunch of startups in that space that try to do what you guys did? Um, there, there have been all over the years, several that have come along trying to do it. Um, and they've all failed. There's not a single one that still, uh, that still exists that I'm aware of that, you know, and I'm, I'm in the space. I'd, I'd probably know if there was. And where do you think they failed? Um, it, it I mean, our, our specific model, it's very complex. Imagine, uh, going out and finding law firms willing to, uh, for a tiny monthly fee, a fraction of $30 a month, uh, to be able to provide all these, this menu of legal services um, that is typically $300 an hour, and they're gonna give it to your whole family for roughly 10 bucks a month from you. Um, you know, the law firm is gonna say, come back when you've got 10,000 paying yeah. subscribers, and now the model works for us. 
So to go get a law firm to be willing to do it before there's 10,000 subscribers is, is catch-22. And the subscribers are not going to sign up until there's a law firm to provide the services. So that catch-22 just keeps them all out of the game. Uh, it, it took our company from 1972 when it was founded until the late 80s until it finally got real traction. And when I got here in 1998, they still weren't even open uh, to provide services in five states. So, hmm. you know, there's a lot of regulatory uh, things and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of barriers uh, barriers to entry. Um, uh, in real estate, um, you know, the barrier of entry is less than that. Um, but there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, you know, you can't just throw together the... the there, there, I've seen network marketers that said, I don't want to be in somebody's downline. I want to my own my own network marketing company. And um, just because somebody has the desire to be the, the, the top at the top doesn't mean they know how to start a company, build it, operate, and, and do all that. It's a totally different ballgame. I personally would never want to own a network marketing company. I would not want to start a real estate company. I like being an independent associate, living my own life, working when I want to work, and let the company and the management team and everything else be provided for me. That's the beauty of network marketing. So, um, again, I, I don't even know where your first question even started. But no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And th this is how our conversations go. So <laughs> yeah. this is exactly what I was looking for. So one of the interesting things about um, having your title or my title is that people normally see a finished product. And... You know, they don't see the ups and downs. The, you know, to achieve the highest levels of success, most of the people I'm, I'm in relationship with have gone through some pretty crazy struggles. In the direct sales business, um, you know, I say companies are a collection of people. And that's what makes or breaks companies. What in, in your journey through um, network marketing, can you share some of the, 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 the wins and the losses that people experience that they may think it's, it's a them thing versus it's just the, the journey thing? Yeah, yeah. So um, I have a saying that I typically try to get across, which is in network marketing, it's all about, we do two things. We sell and we recruit other people to also help us sell, whether you're selling homes or legal plans, doesn't matter, or a weight loss product, whatever. So the goal is how many customers can you get to buy your product or service? And you recruit so that you can get help doing it. So if for me, if I want to have 500,000 customers on the books that I'm getting paid residuals on every month from them being a customer ongoing, um, I'm either going to go out and have, if I'm so good that I'm closing one out of two, I'm going to have to have a million conversations, which is not going to happen in my lifetime. Or I can go out and recruit 50,000 people and everybody's doing, you know, 10, right? So, um, you have to recruit a bunch to find the few who will go out there and sign up the masses. They'll go out and get, you know, you know, sell to the masses. And so uh, at the end of the day, um, the challenge with network marketing that a lot of people can't handle or hack is the disappointment. And we have to manage people's expectations. Uh, when we recruit somebody, they have to, you know, know what to expect. You know, we have to uh, calibrate their expectations so they don't think, oh, I'm going to sign up in this company and I'm going to be rich tomorrow. People say, I don't want to get rich quick scheme. But if they haven't gotten rich in 90 days, they're like, oh, this thing doesn't work. No, it's, it, it's not. It's, you didn't want that. And now that it is not what you didn't want, now you're like, oh, it doesn't work. So um, managing expectations for the person coming into the business and for the person that's recruiting people. You know, uh, for every 10 people I recruit into my business, Maybe a couple of them will, will go out and sign up some customers and probably one out of 50 will actually take it seriously and be a leader and treat it like a business. Um, now, in real estate, it's going to be, you know, for a lot of people, it's their primary source of income. It's not like a typical network marketing business where it's, a, oh, by the way, side home base thing. Um, you know, so you'll probably get a little bit better metric there. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, um, disciplining your disappointments. Um, if you recruit 10 agents into your into your EXP organization and and some of them uh, disappoint you, um, you know, you just have to know that's the nature of the game. And I don't know what the stat is. You know it. I'm not in the industry day to day like you are, but I've been saying this for years, so I probably hope I'm close. Um, there's a high percentage of people that go through the entire deal to get their real estate license, to go pay the money, take the course, to, get the licensing done, continuing ed, all this kind of stuff, and never sell a house. 
just like people get involved in my business and they never sell one legal plan. It's like, why did you bother getting started, pay your money to, you know? So um, I think at the end of the day, um, that's one of the biggest struggles in, in the business model that we're in is, is helping people to set the right, right expectations for a new person coming in on how the business works and how it will work for them and also for the sponsor, the recruiter, the, the leadership that they're gonna be, they're gonna be working with. What I shared um, at, at our, our conference we just had this past weekend in Oklahoma, um, I shared uh, the fact that the mentorship, which is one of the things that we offer in this business model, um, I, I call it game. As a matter of fact, I was going to uh, speak at an event uh, a year ago uh, in February in Chicago when I was getting in the elevator, heading down to do my talk, and this acronym game popped into my head. Like, you got game? And I'm not talking about basketball or golf. I'm talking about great associations, mentors, and environment. Mm. Great associations, mentors, and environment. If you've got, I mean, your associations are always working on you. And if you hang, out, hang around five broke friends, you're bound to be the sixth one. Hang around five millionaires, you're bound to be the sixth one. If they drink, you'll drink. If they, you'll, if they smoke, you'll smoke. If they curse, you'll curse. If they go to church, you go to church. You just become who you hang around. And so what this model of network marketing, rev share, whatever you want to call it, it provides people uh, access to great associations, getting around people who you want to be like. Uh, that it makes a big difference. And then getting around mentors, which is the point I'm trying to get to, um, if I was in a traditional real estate model, um, why in the world would I ever give you my secret sauce on how I'm going out and doing all this production? Because you'll just go out there and take it and use it and go out and capture market share and take away business from me. You'll take food off my table if I did that. But RevShare, if I recruit you, I'm gonna tell you everything I know. I'm gonna pour into you. I'm gonna help you be better than me because I get rewarded. The more money you make, the more money I make. So it's a true alignment of interest that does not exist outside of this revenue share model. Um, and so the mentor mentee, which is going back to my previous you know, point there, um, if, if you bring me in to the business and you're my mentor, if I don't show up as a good mentee, you can't help me and both of us lose. And so as a mentee, I've got to have the right expectations on what that partnership or that relationship looks like. Um, there's a lot of mentor, mentors that get disappointed in the person that they're trying to mentor because they're not showing up on the X. They're not doing, do this and they don't go do that. And so that person gets disappointed and quits and then the mentor is like, you know, do I really want to bother trying to mentor somebody else next? So you can't drag that past forward. I talk about that in building an empire. If the last five agents you brought aboard, you know, shit the bed didn't do anything. Does that mean you don't believe in recruiting anymore? Some people struggle with that. But just because the last five people didn't do much, does that you just, you can't transfer that and put that on your next you know, prospect that could be your sixth recruit, that could be the next Jay Kinder or Dan Beer or whoever, right? So um, anyway, yeah, going no, down a rabbit hole here. That's exactly what I, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and how do you balance that? Because you, know, you, you can control activity, you just can't control results is what I'm hearing. Sure. And, and how do you balance pouring enough into it? Because our numbers, um, I actually do know them, and it's like, as an industry, 66% of the people quit after year one, and by year five, it's like 90%. Sure. So, you know, both of our businesses are very aspirational, right? Flexibility, big opportunity for income. Um, so that's, that's a constant struggle there of you chose this opportunity because of flexibility and upside, but then you don't, you're not willing to do the consistent, repeatable activity to get sure. the result you're looking for. Right. Let's talk about shiny object syndrome, which happens in all opportunities like this because, uh, again, you, you, you're the boss, and so no one can tell you what to do or what to do every day. Um, and you know, being in the industry for 20 plus years, I, I always see agents have shiny object syndrome with tech trends, uh, have you tried this new company? Talk to me about that. Yeah. Before I answer uh, that, let me just finish one last thought because it'll play into this, the game, great associations, mentors, and environment. And the environment that you'll find in eXp, for example, and in our company, um, it's all about growth personal development. I mean, look, money like water seeks its own level. If you're a $50,000 a year person, you're not going to make a quarter million a year. And somehow, if you're in the right place at the right time and you catch momentum and you re recruit the right people, you might get to a quarter million a year. But if you don't become a quarter million dollar a year person, it's going to come back down to who you are. So being in an environment that is all about personal development and growth uh, will, and, and encouragement and, and when, you're, when you're at a low, have people lifting you up and vice versa, 
uh, I think game is everything. And one of the things that, uh, that team leaders in EXP uh, ought to be focused on, um, if I was in EXP, uh, and I'm not, I'm a shareholder, a big believer in the company, uh, but I'm not in the, in the game building it, uh, I would focus a lot on helping agents understand uh, the cash flow quadrant from Robert Kiyosaki, the E, the S, the B, and the I. People say, well, I w I'm, I'm tired of being an employee, so I'm going to go get into real estate. And I can be self-employed. I can call my own shots and make as much money as I want. Well, they're still trading their time for money. And there are people, there are agents that, are, that you, you can make a lot of money just selling houses. Uh, there's people who make six and seven figures just selling houses. Um, but that's still on the left side of the, of the structure of the, of the quadrants, the E, the S. The, the freedom is on the right side, which is the B and the I. Uh, the B quadrant is a big business owner who's got a system and who's got other people making them money. Uh, and it also could stand for, in real estate, broker. Um, and you don't need to go out there and start your own brokerage um, like you had to back in my early days, but you can just get into a rev share model like this and get paid like a broker without all the exposure and overhead and everything else that comes with it. And so, um, and then once you have B quadrant cash flow coming in, you can put that money into investments. Now your money's making you money and stand in those two quadrants. To me, uh, agents should decide that they want to get into EXP to change where they live. They want to get out of the S quadrant and get into the B quadrant. Hmm. It's a it's 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 a value system. It's it's uh, it's you know it's their end game. Like, do you want to stay on the sales treadmill forever, or do you want freedom and you know time freedom and and all that? So, uh, changing quadrants of where somebody lives is the reason why you should recruit. For example, um, and, and again, it comes down to having game. Uh, you know, you can go out and start your own brokerage, or you can do it within the structure where you don't have to take on all the exposure and overhead. Now, with all that being said, I don't even remember the last question, so bring it back to me again. Yeah, no, the shiny penny syndrome. Yeah. So I've watched people. It, it's funny. It, I've watched people like in my own business uh, that uh, became successful, moderately successful, and decided, oh, I'm going to go write a book. Or they started getting good at speaking and training. So all of a sudden, they wanted to be a professional speaker. So sometimes it's not a new opportunity like another network marketing business, but it's um, like they want to kind of go off on a different path now. And a lot of the times they were successful doing what they're doing, and then they write a book and realize a year or two later, oh my gosh, there's no money in books, and now I'm going broke. <laughs> I'm, authors aren't making money. I, I've, I'm an author of four books that have all become bestsellers. There's not much money to be made there. People don't understand that until they figure it out themselves. Uh, these speakers, you know, traveling around now trying to be Mr. Motivator, they're, they're grinding it out, trying to find gigs to get on stages, and they get worn out that way too. And so that's that kind of a shiny object. I've seen people that left my business to go off and sell this soap, lotion, potion, whatever kind of network marketing, the new ground floor deal, because they, they, if they weren't achieving the kind of success that they wanted to here with, like with me, they're like, oh, well, I just need to go get in. I'm going to go be the next Brian Curler somewhere else. I'm going to go get in on a ground floor deal. That's the shiny object. I'm going to go get into that new company. Just because you change the name of the company you're in does not mean you're the next Brian Carruthers because you got to go do the work that Brian did to build this organization. J going, going from a, an established company with me as your help to go out there and try to do it on your own um, in a company that does not have the cred they don't have the track record. They don't have the success stories and all that. And now you got to go out and create it. If you couldn't do it here, you ain't doing it there. And I've mm. seen that. I've seen that play out hundreds or thousands of times. And a tenth of one percent actually go somewhere else and make money and, and and become really successful. And it breaks my heart. You know, you you pour time and energy, and this is not about me being butthurt about this. You know, I'm just the rea the, the truth is, I pour time and energy away from my family and you know, in, in things I could be doing mm -hmm. to work with this person, help develop them. And they're like, oh, well, um, it's not, I'm not getting where I want to go fast enough here, so I'm going to go try to do it somewhere else. And then they wind up just getting out of the industry because they didn't do it here. They had a miserable failure there, and now they go get a job and go back to being trapped again. Uh, so, um, And I'm sure it happens in, in, in real estate as well. I mean, you know, it's easy to start up a real estate company and say, hey, come over here and you'll be ground floor. Well, again, going back to our previous conversation, uh, here's, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. Um, I'm on um, my second and final marriage. And uh, whether it be with girlfriends back in the day or whether it was in a previous marriage, uh, my mom uh, gave me some sage advice. She said, 
Um, do you really want to be with somebody different? Um, and, you know, we have, we have whatever the conversation was. She said, you're just going to find a, a, new, a new person with a different set of problems. Mm. You've you got a problem here. you got this, these problems you're dealing with. But if you go to a new person, they're just going to be a new set of problems. Um, so for me, it's like if somebody started up another company in the legal services space and they're like, oh, I'm going to go find an opportunity over there. Well, first of all, they haven't even gone through all the growth challenges. I mean, our company almost shut down. In the 80s, uh, our founders, Harlan Shirley Stonecipher, had to hock their furniture, their home furniture they had to sell hmm. in order to make payroll and keep the lights on. If they weren't able to pull that off, then our company, as you know it now today, as a almost a $3 billion company, wouldn't exist. And so um, the shiny object, once you get there, the shine wears off real quick, and it's not it's just an object. <laughs> it's just not, it's not shiny. And so um, I just my my word of advice to people is um, just be very careful about that. Um, not to say that uh, that there's never going to be another startup that's that's going to not succeed. I mean, there will be success stories that will happen. Um, it's just few and far between. And I, I personally find a lot of uh, of peace. Uh, I'm all about being happy. Mm. I make a lot of money, but forget the money. It's, I know a lot of people a lot of money and they're not happy or they're stressed out. Or they're worried about uh, looking around every next corner. When's a shoe going to fall? When's my life going to change and get disrupted because something happened? I, I would put a lot of cr- uh, credence in, in in being, again, if I was in, in real estate, I'd be in EXP because I, I know the track record. I know everything that's in place. Um, I can count on it. And so that you know that, that's my advice for the shiny object kind of scenario. So I, I mentioned in the beginning that we, we've been in each other's orbit for a long time. And uh, in my 20s, when I was selling, I actually sold a bunch of houses to some of your top uh, leaders. Yep. And, and you have an amazing group of leaders that I personally know. How, how did you identify them? How do you pour into it to create the size leaders that are now part of the corporate team of the company and, and you know, very visible in your industry? Great question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to... Um, the mission. So when I first got into this company, I went to the convention and I walked up to the foot of the stage. I turned around and looked out at the vast audience, uh, all the seats in that arena. And I saw all these people pouring into them. And I said, the person who founded this company, who was originally a school teacher and selling insurance part-time, I said, he, he started this whole thing. He had a mission of, of giving people equal access to the justice system that otherwise most people were priced out of at $300 an hour. I said, he's got a noble mission. I'm buying into the mission. I love the mission. And then it came down to if he could put all this team together, I'm as good as he is. I can take what he's already built, all the infrastructure, all the tools, all the success stories, and I can just go run with that. I can go out and do again what he's already done. And he's already been through all the trials and tribulations. Like he's, the company has gone through the storms and has come out and is sunny now. I can go out and build in the sun? Heck yeah. So that's that's what I did. I, I, I made a decision um, that I was going to take it seriously. I was going to commit. Um, I, I made his mission my mission. And uh, I I understood the company vision. And then I, had, I formed my vision mm. within that company vision. And then I started to help people see their vision for their businesses, for their lives. So it was a company vision, my vision, and then their vision. So I, I just really kind of got good at, at um, helping people to see the company vision and my vision. Nobody wants to buy, well, they need to buy into the company vision and my vision, but that's not what's going to put the food on their table. It's their vision. You know, what, what does your life look like now? And if you get on board with this and run and build with me, you know, three years, five years from now, here's what your life, here's what your business is going to look like. Um, I, and I just sold the vision every day. And that's what we have to do as, as builders. And so when you find, again, you recruit a bunch to find the few, you identify those few leaders, you mm-hmm. pour into them. Everything is about them. Build them up. Um, some, some, some of us, you know, we're starfish. We just want to get up on that, on that stage and soak in all the spotlight, suck all the air out of the room. And some people realize, you know, once you get there, okay, that's great. Like when I, I, I don't, I wear this, I wore this today so I can share it. I don't normally wear this, but, um, in my first year I was like, Hey, when I hit this certain level, I'm going to go and buy uh, a Rolex. And so it was a driver for me. I, it stays, it stays in my safe. I don't wear it anymore. Um, um, just cause it's not important anymore. It, it served its purpose at the time. Um, so as a leader, you know, you have to have the, the things that are going to drive you. Mm-hmm. 
but you have to figure out what's going to drive the people that you're working with. I know I have a lot of people, like some of the people you know, they weren't driven by, they didn't want the Rolex. They wanted something else. They wanted more time with their spouse or their kids. They want to put their kids in a, in a private school. They want to build a house, whatever it is. So I think it comes down to what's important for you to dri- that drives you. Focus on that while you're helping to identify who your future leaders are and help figure out what their why is and keep it in front of them constantly. And soon enough, you're not on stage. You're in the back of the room like a proud papa clapping for all the people that you helped develop and they're up on stage, mm. you know, getting the spotlight. So, so w- one of the things I, I talk about when I speak is that there's seasons to everything, right? Uh, we were just talking before the camera's rolling uh, of the quote, youth is wasted on the young because you just don't know what you don't know. W- what do you think about folks that build and then think they can just unplug, right? Because one of the cool things about knowing you is I also know what people say behind your back. And one of the things they say, you're still a grinder. You're talk, you, you were still one of the top, you know, attractors at your company. Well, I, I was number three, not number one, but number three. And it's great because people, I, I love seeing people go out there and outperform me. Uh, one of my things is I, I never want to let anybody outwork me. And that was my, my kind of my mantra for, for a long time. I mean, I personally recruited 10 people a month for my first 10 years in building my business. And that's not normal. Most people don't yeah. recruit that much. <laughs> I mean, so number three for 2023. So 25 years in the business and still one of the top recruiters. In your 25th year. In my 25th year, yeah. So I'm a believer in leading by example. It's hard for me to say, do what I did a long time ago. Because mm. somebody might say, well, it worked a long time ago. It doesn't work like that anymore. Times have changed. You used to have hair, you're bald now. Or whatever, they, they'll, <laughs> yeah. they'll attach it to whatever. So... Um, I, f- I feel like if I can say to somebody, hey, th- not, hey, this is how I recruited in 2010. If I can say, here's how I just signed up my Uber. By the way, I just recruited my Uber driver last Tuesday, taking me to DCA to go out to our convention. So I was able to be on stage at the convention and say, hey, just a couple of days ago, the guy who drove me to the airport, I sent him a video. He watched a third party tool, hit me back. I sent him to my website. He signed up and now he's going into the training class. Like, you know, so I want to be able to say, here's what I'm currently doing. I want to, I want to stay relevant. Mm. So I think that's a part of the thing is, is, is being relevant, um, leading by example. I don't, I don't want to be a hypocritical leader and say, go, go do as I say, but not as I do. Uh, uh, one thing is, one of the things I've, I heard a long time ago, and I forget who even said it now, but I'd rather watch a leader than to listen to one any day. It's easy for somebody who can go out and bark orders and tell people what to do, but it's, it's better when you can do it with them. I, if I recruited you, I'd say, I wouldn't say, hey, Leo, go do it. I'd say, let's go do it. And that let's go do it together gives you confidence. It, it, it helps you uh, feel safe. It, you, you know you're in good hands. We're, you know. So um, one of the components of that is, uh, you know, there is a, the people who did it before, I call them the Hall of Famers. And they deserve credit. They deserve praise, recognition. You know, if they're, they're a top earner, they got to build this massive team. That's awesome. Um, we should never play them down. We, of course, if I'm a company owner, an executive, a top leader, if somebody on my team decides that they want to unplug, it bums me out that they're not going to be producing and building bigger. But somebody's got to be the example of the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, is there a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow or am I going to grind until I'm dead? Um, I've, I've had to explain to people uh, a lot that I work, I work half as hard as I used to, by the way. I'm golfing, fishing, hanging out with my three boys, my wife, traveling all, of, all the time. Got my hands in a lot of investments and stuff. So I've, I'm not working near as much. I'm not doing 10 recruits a month, you know, uh, like I did either. But, um, but there needs to be, you know, people celebrated to say, hey, if you go out there and build a team, you got all this rev share money coming in. You can live in Puerto Rico. You can do whatever you want to do. Go f- float around in your boat, whatever. Because the masses, all those people in the field need to say, that's what I'm working towards. So we got to have them. Now, um, what I would say is, um, as a shareholder, what I would like to see, get the Hall of Famers chasing Pro Bowl again. Like there's Pro Bowlers right now in my company, your company, and whatever. They're out there earning it. They're earning the stripes. Last year, they, they were in the Pro Bowl because they were performing. They were kicking butt. But um, it would be really cool to see everybody just all lean in for like three to six months. Just go to town, recruit, build, train, motivate, get in the trenches, do the events and all that. I mean, this company could be 3X, 4X, 5X from where it is today just in a matter of a year or two. 
Um, you know, but, you know, and some pro bowlers um, are going to keep on going out there and, and, and performing. And some of the Hall of Famers, uh, they'll still just remain uh, the aspirational. Hey, this is what I'm looking forward to. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about what I see with with EXP, man. I'm, I'm I, as a shareholder, I'm holding on to every share. I, I don't understand how anybody sells shares. I, re I really don't. Like you have a chance to own the company that you're helping to build. Now. Full disclosure, disclaimer, whatever you want to call it. I'm not here to give any financial advice, okay? I'm not a, a licensed broker-dealer, but um, I, I think it's cool to be able to own shares in a, in a company that's, uh, that's got this growth trajectory. So, Hey, Brian, I really appreciate the, the conversation. That, that's exactly what I wanted to give you know, the folks who can't always be in the rooms where you and I are having a conversation. Thank you for your wisdom, your leadership, and I'm super excited to have you at one of our next in-person events so more people can enjoy this. Awesome. Great to see you here.